Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Future Audio Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Danica Remy. Danica is the president of the B612 Foundation, an organization dedicated to protecting Earth from asteroid impacts. She previously led operations for several business and philanthropic organizations, providing expertise and extensive experience in information technology, facilities, human resources, finance, and government relations. Danica also co-founded the international program Asteroid Day, supported by the government of Luxembourg and sanctioned by the United Nations as an official day to increase global awareness and education of asteroids. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Danica, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Us as well. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to being the president of the B612 Foundation. Wow, that's a lot to cover in a sh- in a short time. You um, have I 90 think seconds. That, that, yeah. yeah, I think that I think that you know the the highlight is that I'm a techno optimist. Um, I believed in technology for a very long time. Had the opportunity to ride um, through the early technology, early internet days, all the way through the dot com bust, and then after the bust, I took a little bit of a a shift, running both finance and operations for an organization for many years, and then recently, eight years ago, took over um, running this organization called B612 Foundation, um, which is dedicated to protecting the planet from asteroid impacts. and And um, while it seems like it's a a a, a insurmountable problem and actually what's so wonderful about it is that if you understand technology and you listen to the technologists, um, it's actually probably the only existential risk we actually know how to solve. And so I thought it would be pretty exciting to work on a global problem that only a small group of folks really needed to focus on. Um, and so I've been here with the organization for the last eight years. So can you look at the craters and determine what what year it was that each of them hit um uh, each of them was created and then uh kind of put together a timeline as to how how overdue we are for the next one uh well a couple of things we love to use media crater which is located outside of flagstaff arizona as one of our most favorite teaching tools for um, um, engaging the public around this question of asteroid impact so it's a impact site that happened fifty thousand years ago and um, you can fit you know most of downtown san francisco into that crater even with the new salesforce tower uh, and and it's a great example of where um, that particular asteroid impact taught us an awful lot that we didn't know until actually very recently about asteroid impacts. Um, so the the geologist uh, Eugene Shoemaker, who was doing work um, uh, in the White Sands um, during the uh, for the testing of atomic bombs, was very. Um, uh, clear about the geology and the geological impact um, after these bombs would be exploded. And, and he was visiting Meteor Crater, which is not you know best preserved meteor impact site in the world. And he realized that the geological structure was that that was similar to when something exploded. And so the geology there taught us um, enough information for us to really realize that that particular site that they thought was a volcano actually was an impact site. And this was very, very early in the, you know, the, the late 60s, early 70s that this sort of realization um, came to be. And in fact, that particular site was a place where the Apollo astronauts were trained on geology so that when they went to the moon, they would know how to um, pick up and look for and identify um, different things. So so impact sites teach us a lot, and we're just beginning to learn. If you think about humanity from a 
long time frame as opposed to a election cycle or even a decade um, cycle. Right. And we have a lot to learn about asteroids and asteroid impacts, but we're learning very quickly. And so that's one of the things that's exciting about what's happening right now with um, asteroid science and asteroid missions. I love it. I love it. You, you described yourself as a techno optimist and I usually describe myself as techno volatile. I don't know if you've heard that term or not, where it's, it's, it's not so much that I think by default technology will be good or bad. I think that it has the potential to be either one and that human judgment and, and human decision making will kind of decide which way the, the die ends up coming up. So I, I just wonder if that is a worked out philosophical position or just if in general you think the tendency is for technology to bend the arc of the universe towards goodness. Uh, well, my hope is that technology will bend the arc to good news. And I, and I know that technology has and will continue to um, present incredible challenges for humanity um, as we move forward. We are just beginning to kind of understand um, how to even talk about the risks that come along with technology, the moral risks, the ethical risks, the technological risks, the unknown risks. Um, and so um, while I'm an optimist, I am I'm well aware um, uh, and cognizant of the incredible challenges that technology is presenting to humanity. So I kind of think that the world, collectively, the world is going to get it about 80 percent right. So there's the optimist. And that 20 percent of the technology solutions are going to really mess us up. Um, and we're going to have some very hard and ethical and moral questions that we're going to have to deal with. And we're just learning how to start talk, talk about those kinds of um, those those kinds of questions. So 80 percent, I'm an optimist. That is a very compelling answer. So you said that part of what drew you to B612 was the idea of working on a truly global problem that only required a small number of people to solve it. I have not spent that much time looking into asteroid mitigation, but it's, it seems like you would need a lot of people. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of technology that would, that would need to be developed. And given what you've said, perhaps I'm wrong about that. So what, what's kind of the group size that you would need in order to try to ameliorate the risks associated with asteroid impacts? Well, I think there's a lot packed into that question. So first of all, um, uh, asteroid impacts is the only existential risk that we generally agree that we know how to prevent. And in order to prevent it, we need to know where they are and where they're going. So the biggest challenge right now to humanity actually is asteroid discovery. Um, and, and, and so, you know, one of the things that we did at B612 was help launch something called Asteroid Day, which is a global call to action to all of humanity for governments, universities, private businesses, and private citizens to accelerate the rate of asteroid discovery. Um, that's our biggest barrier at the moment. What's kind of backwards about the organization that I run today, B612, is that the, 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 the founders of the organization, Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikart and Ed Liu, who um, is still with the organization as the executive director of our Asteroid Institute, they started with the deflection question. And so um, Ed and another astronaut developed something called a gravity tractor. So the concept of um, uh, putting a small spacecraft near an asteroid and the gravity between the two of them tugging the asteroid into a different orbit. Um, that was to complement an already existing technique that, that, that humanity or our government um, uh, tested, which was with the deep impact when we um, slammed a, a small spacecraft into an aging comet. Now the science goals were not to measure the change of the orbit, um, but they know that it did change the orbit. And the good news is that just two weeks ago on um, November 24th, NASA launched the double asteroid redirect test mission from Vandenberg Air Force Base here in California. And in just a short 11 months, we are going to, that spacecraft is going to smash into um, uh, an asteroid and we are going to measure very precisely what the uh, impact uh, results are um, with respect to changing its orbit or trajectory. So it's a very simple concept. We're familiar with billiards. When a ball hits right. a ball, it moves the ball. Right. And so that's what we're doing in space. Now, 
we're not doing that. B612 is not doing that. We've advocated um, for 20 years that humanity needed to do a technology demonstration mission before we knew what was heading towards us. And so the great news is that here we are, you know, 18 years after creating the organization, NASA has done it. As well, um, the European Space Agency has a complementary mission called the HERA mission that's going to arrive two years later uh, and do a lot of measurements and analysis of that impact site on, on the asteroid that it will um, uh, uh, crash into. So um, when we say it's a small group, it's a small group of people who are in space agencies, who are advancing space technology, who are, you know, experts in astrophysics and, and you know, any number of things. But it's not like climate change, for example, where a lot of people, a lot of governments and a lot of businesses are going to have to change the way in which they operate. It's a small group of dedicated people who are going to help advance the technology for the solution should we know that an asteroid is coming at us. So that's why I say it's a manageable task by a small group. I, I love that. The coordination problem is nowhere near as vast and insuperable. And we don't have to get a vaccine to prevent that. <laughs> no, no, no. And 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 one of the things that that um, we're building here at the Asteroid Institute, um, B612, is a is a software platform. We do it in partnership with Google and the University of Washington and the scientists um, and engineers um, at uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is a telescope that will go live and. In just a couple of years, we're building a platform to analyze the data that's going to come in from LSST, which will be the largest asteroid discoverer when it goes live, um, uh, to know whether or not an asteroid has our address on it. And we're building that platform, you know, kind of think of it as, as Google Maps for space. We're building it in an open source environment. We're making available our tools and the algorithms for everybody to look at understand um, and interpret um, and ask questions about. And, and to the sort of COVID point, the important part of this asteroid problem is that we don't want this to be secretive. Right. When we know one is coming, we want Brazil, the European Union, and JAXA to all agree that that asteroid is, you know, its range of uncertainty, its possibility that we, that we collectively individuals and governments and universities actually agree where it is and where it's going. And COVID was, you know, a great example of where, you know, we weren't open and we weren't transparent as we could have been as things are starting to unfold. And so we believe that it's important early on to make available the information about the future Sometimes we like to joke, it's a little bit of a time machine. How often can you actually, you know, predict in time what you have the data when something's going to happen, right. whether it's yeah. tomorrow or in a hundred years or in a thousand years. Um, we want to make sure that everybody uh, agrees generally as to whether or not one of them has our address on it. I, I love that. And I think that's a very important perspective to take. So are you uh, putting together like a top 10 FBI list of the top asteroids that are uh, kind of looming out there that have us in their crosshairs? Well, we're not doing that. That <laughs> list actually already exists, and it's held at the Minor Planet Center, which is the, um, the, the place where everybody puts their asteroid data, whether it's a, a, an amateur astronomer or, you know, one of the two biggest um, current asteroid um, discovering telescopes, PanSTARRS um, um, and the Catalina Sky Survey. They make available their data through the Minor Planet Center. And then JPL um, does calculations on some of the ones that are, are at risk. They don't share their calculations, but they share their results. Um, uh, and likewise, there's a group in the European Union um, in Frascati that's supported by ESA that does those same calculations. So the top 10 list, the risk list, um, is both at JPL um, and at the um, ESA program. We're not in charge of the top 10 list. Okay. okay I got you. But you, <laughs> but presumably you are helping with the mapping effort. And you said the biggest challenge facing humanity is the asteroid discovery part of it. So is that because we already have a lot of technology for deflecting asteroids or destroying them? That problem is somewhat solved. And it's more a matter of knowing when they're coming so that we can kind of 
protect ourselves or is it just because there's so much to, to map and to explore? Um, the, the problem is we don't have enough eyes on the sky. So right now, our two biggest uh, asteroid hunters are Catalina Sky Survey and Pan Stars. LSST is going to come on board in, in two years. Ground-based, these are ground-based telescopes, and will deliver over the course of its um, what's called mission life, um, you know, about a quarter of a million asteroids. Today, in that database of asteroids that come near Earth, remember, we care about the ones that come near Earth, not the ones that are out there by the, uh, the asteroid belt. There's 28,000 in the database, but there's more than 3 million that are larger than the one that blew up in Chelyabinsk in 2013. So, um, you know, we're finding about, with our current tools, we're finding about 3,000 new asteroids a year. LSST is going to increase that risk, but we need to have other, other eyes on the sky. And the best way to find them is to have them in space. And so NASA has been advancing a concept called um, uh, the, the NEO survey mission, um, infrared. Um, we hope that it gets funded and, and flies. Um, it has received um, some funding and I think has a tentative launch date of um, uh, 2026. But we're gonna need more instruments than just uh, NEOSIM to find the, the smaller, more um, frequent asteroids um, that are in the smaller um, size range. So this is where emerging technology is going to come in. We're going to get better and better at finding things. Our optics are going to get better and better. Our ability to launch, it already has gotten better and better for us to be able to launch um, satellites into, into both LEO, um, but more importantly, into, into, into space. And so as those costs come down and the technology gets cheaper and small business, um, you know, is starting to do what governments used to do. We are hopeful that the future will, in fact, deliver new technologies that help us accelerate the rate of asteroid discovery. So, what is what is the smallest asteroid that you can currently track? Is it the size of a garbage truck? Is it the size of uh, Chicago? It depends on where they are. So, first of all, the good news is that NASA has found ninety three percent of the asteroids that are of the size or larger that wiped out the dinosaurs. So there's um, about a thousand asteroids um, in that in that size range. So I just want all of your listeners to know <laughs> that um, it's unlikely that we're gonna go the way of the dinosaur. NASA's current goal um, is to find the asteroids larger than 140 meters. Um, and right now we've found about 30% of those. Um, and there's about 25,000 in that size range. As you go down the size to the smaller ones, down to the size of the one that, that ex, uh, uh, exploded in uh, Chelyabinsk in, in 2014, 2013, um, you know, there's, there's, there's about 3 million. So, and we have a lot to find. They can track them if they see them at a small range. I don't actually know exactly what size they are able to track, but, but the real issue is that there's not enough eyes in the sky. We have no information. That's, that's the problem that we like the public to know, which is that accelerating the rate of discovery, encouraging NASA to invest in um, discovery missions, encouraging ESA and JAXA and other you know, countries that have a you know, open uh, scientific um, uh, point of view um, for you know, these kinds of space missions. We want the public to say, we want you to find them. We want you to invest your money to help find them. What's what's what I found um, quite exciting is in 2018, um, uh, Pew Research uh, asked the American public um, what were the most important things that um, uh, NASA should have as a top priority. And I'm really happy to say that climate and monitoring the skies for asteroids were neck and neck, neck and neck. That you know that that those are the top two priorities for what the American public thinks NASA should be doing. So I think that our advocate, the advocating work that we've done and other people have done um, around this discovery question um, uh, is starting to uh, see some of the fruits of everyone's labor. So that addresses the funding part of it, but you've also mentioned that emerging technology might play a role in this. So given that 
you've made that statement and you've also said that we need more eyes in the sky. Do you think we, we basically have the probe technology that we need and it's primarily a matter of getting the money out there, building them and launching them or yep. so, so that's, that's what's required. Yep. And more what, eyes on the sky. What, what kind of progress has been made in that regard? Um, well, I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to watch over time because, um, you know, the past going to space was funded by governments. The future is going to space is being funded by private industry. And so as we watch the shift of where the investments are done, um, the, the, the sort of the question of um, how will the technology be put in place has different drivers. The government previously is from a, um, a, a, a science and exploration. That was NASA's goal. Um, when we think about moving out into the solar system, B612, you know, funded by um, uh, uh, private citizens around the world, B612's goal is to protect the planet from asteroid impacts. But there's a lot of entrepreneurs and people who believe in space resources and utilizing those resources in space. And so when you think about commercial enterprise and commercial enterprises motivation, while we're building a map to protect the planet, that same map is going to be valuable for those people who want to move out into space. Asteroids are the largest, you know, there's more celestial asteroids are the largest celestial body units in our solar system. So there's a lot of places to go. Um, and, and so I think, and many people in the field think that while right now government is largely funding the discovery work, in the future, there are going to be reasons why private industry is going to want to support that discovery work. Can we talk a little bit about that transition? Transition because it's something I've I've thought about as well and noticed as well, but I haven't given the problem a whole lot of study. So, given where you're at, I think that you you interact with these agencies, you interact with private companies, and you have a much better vantage on the move from funding these things through government mechanisms as as against funding them through private. Uh, enterprises and companies. So I was just wondering if you could give any comment on that. Um, well, I mean, I, I think that if you think about the early days of the internet, I mean, the internet was developed by DARPA. Right. Um, and then people laid um, um, things on top of that infrastructure. And from there, new businesses were laid uh, on top of that infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, as we think about moving out into space, it's very early. I mean, there's a lot of business happening right now in LEO, low Earth orbit, you know, flying just above our home planet with most everything pointing down or sending signals back and forth to the ground. Um, as we uh, uh, evolve, um, humanity is going to move out into space. And so what does that um, adventure look like? We didn't. Did we know what we were going to see when we, you know, ventured um, across the sea to America? No, we didn't know what we were going to find. That was part there. of the point, part of the fun. That's right. That's part of the fun. And so we're in a really exciting time. I like to say that this decade is kind of the decade of asteroid discovery. I mean, we've got the DART mission. We have the um, OSIRIS-REx coming back after having collected samples from Bennu. We've got the Lucy mission. We've got the Psyche mission. We're going to learn so much about these celestial bodies in the next decade. And at the same time, technology is going to continue to advance at an incredibly rapid pace. Um, so, you know, I, I think we we don't know where the investment's going to come from. Um, we know right now that, of course, um, you know, people are very excited about being a space tourist. And we've got, you know, commercial businesses who are, you know, happy to take your money to to give you a short ride um, up into space and back down and in the future. Um, and, you know, a small number of people have been able to actually um, go to and stay on the space station, um, paying their own freight, paying their own dollar. That's going to change in the next, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of hard to say how the commercial world is going to unfold as we move out into our solar system. So what what's a dollar amount? How much, how much is needed uh, to... Uh, in funding at this point? You know, it depends on who you talk to and what technology you're going to build and whether or not, you know, you're going to build it by going to a Northrop Grumman or if you're going to build it by, you know, five or six people in a garage um, in Los Angeles. 
right? And so, you know, it's it's just in many ways, it was like the internet, right? I mean, we had these great big, huge supercomputer mainframe developers and, you know, a couple of folks in their garage came up with a competing product that was cheaper. So I can't answer that question. It could be a lot or it could just happen with, you know, rapid innovation that, you know, we, I can't, I'm not a, you know, I can't see into the future. Um, innovation um, uh, and mixing and matching of various uh, technology that, you know, makes it happen fairly rapidly and what, inexpensively. What does the mapping process look like? So the mapping process, um, there's sort of two components to it. One, you need data. And right? so right now we have an absence of data. We have some data. We've got 28,000 asteroids in the database at um, the Minor Planet Center. LSST is going to deliver more. We've got a slow um, percolating sets of um, uh, 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 data that's 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 coming in through um, uh, the smaller telescopes and the uh, amateur network. Um, for us at B612, we're super excited and all focused on getting a you know our software product ready to receive the data that's going to come in from Vera Rubin, um, uh, formerly known as LSST. But we're also excited about, um, you know, sort of the platform that we've been building is 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 going through the old data sets, um, and and I think the thing that's important to to know about asteroid discovery is that to see an asteroid once doesn't mean you've discovered it. It means that you saw it and you have no idea where it's going or where it's been. And so the software that we're building is um, all about trajectory analysis and orbit determination. So you need to see something multiple times or you need to understand the mathematics of the arc so that you can connect these objects over time in a very large um, volume of space. So um, we just um, published with our partners, University of Washington, um, a paper um, uh, called Thor, uh, trackless heliocentric object recovery, um, where yes. we basically um, use software, mathematics, and computational power to um, link these objects that didn't have the normal, what are called four pairs of observations. Um, we're in the process of, of going through much larger data sets than the first data sets that, that we um, um, did Thor with. Um, through older um, sets of data. And we believe that we're going to be able to find an awful lot of um, asteroids by linking observations from a telescope on one part of the world to a telescope on another part of the world. They all have their timestamps of when they see things, but the math and the arc of an asteroid um, is fairly consistent. Um, so, you know, we can do these kinds of calculations to link them together, even though they were observed at different times through different telescopes. So that'll be another way that we'll start accelerating discovery, right? It's like figuring out and finding the noise in these other data sets and future data sets where you don't necessarily have one where you've, you know, clearly seen it and tracked it through a telescope, but that you can infer um, through the mathematics that, in fact, the one you saw over here is the one you saw over there. And did you say the platform and the data sets are open source? Uh, the platform that we're building, ADAM, which stands for Asteroid Discovery Analysis and Mapping Platform, um, is open source. Um, the data will be the data that people use to run on it. So if you think of what we're building as we're building a set of services, with APIs, mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, we may store people's data sets or common data sets that you know people want to crunch through an awful lot. But you know, our goal is that people can go and run their own calculations and challenge our calculations and look at our algorithms and you know help make them better, um, uh, so that you know we're not the only ones who are looking at it. Like this is where transparency becomes really important. Um, it's like, is that math right? Did I get the same results when I put, you know, my data into your algorithm or use your algorithm? Um, so, yes, open source. We are a big believer in open source. I, I'm curious as to who's building the data sets. And I know that you've you've mentioned a couple of names and acronyms throughout the conversation. I wanted to get a list of them kind of all in one place as the answer to a single question. So who is it that's building these data sets that I might take and put on Adam for the purposes of analysis? 
Okay, well, so there's a there's a lot of these data sets that came come out of different telescopes, and I actually won't be able to give you um, that list unless I shuffle through some papers um, <laughs> to find them. Um, but but just know that if if you are a, a, an observatory and you're pointing towards the sky, you create your own data sets. So the one that we're building towards, um, which is the most important from a planetary defense perspective. Um, is called Vera Rubin, the first major observatory named after a woman. Um, it's in Chile, um, and and their data stream is called um, LSST. That used to be the name of the telescope, but they renamed it after a woman, and now it's the uh, Legacy Survey of uh, Space and Time. And that data stream is what we will be, you know, pushing through Adam, looking for the asteroids and doing the computation of where is it today and where, is it, where will it be um, tomorrow. So that's one. To us, that's our biggest partner right now. Um, but we've done other data sets, and I can't tell you the telescope it came out of, um, unless I had a list in front of me, um, uh, DECAM, and I think uh, uh, a, a, a few others. Um, and there are hundreds of these data sets. And so it's 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 about knitting them together. Um, we're gonna knit a few of them together, but other people are gonna use our tools to knit their own data sets together. And, and that's what we think is really important that we're building the services um, and, and, and there will be some data sets that will live in our cloud or accessible through our cloud that the services can call upon. But if you want to set up your own, um, uh, you know, cloud version of our our platform, whether it's on AWS or Azure or 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 um, GCP. Uh, uh, yeah, GCP, that's the goal that you should be able to download what we're doing and then run your own instance of it. Um, so, with your own data. Well, I'm very impressed by the transparency and the approach that you're taking. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Do you have? Do you have one asteroid that's the evil one that's just looming out there that um, uh, you've got your eye on it, that uh, it could be the one that's going to circle around and smack us when we're not looking? Perhaps in the shape of a giant boot or a frowny face. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there probably are a couple that um, people pay close attention to, you know, what's on that, you know, high risk list. Uh, and I don't know their numbers. Um, the one that certainly was part of B612's organizational history was um, an asteroid called Apophis, which has been basically de-risked um, through additional observations. Like the thing that's really important is that you can't you won't know where an asteroid is going if you haven't seen it enough times to confirm its um, arc and trajectory. So um, uh, Apophis um, for a long time uh, was one of concern um, and through additional observations and additional calculations, um, you know, it's it's recently, you know, just absolutely 100% been de-risked. And so that's the one that the public has heard a lot about. And there's, you know, continues to be a lot of clickbait around um, Apophis coming and um, coming and wiping us all out. Um, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Well, that's good news. <laughs> Apophis has been rehabilitated. That's right. <laughs> from a, yes. From or a, delisted. Delisted. There you go. <laughs> From a hardware perspective, how many more probes would we need to launch into space to feel pretty good about our knowledge. I was going to say cartography, but I guess it's not the right word. It'd be solography or, or something like that. Uh, how, how many probes will we need? What, what's the gap that we would need to make up in order to feel pretty good about knowing where the danger lies? Well, I mean, that has to do with how um, the instruments are designed. So basically the field of view, how much of the, of the sky a telescope can see. And so this again is where the advances of technology and computational capability that you know we can do here on the ground, but in the future we'll be able to do in space. Um, so it's I think it's a little bit I, I wouldn't and no one on our team would would forecast a, a an answer to that question. It really does depend on the rate of technological advancement, um, the decline of the cost of going to space, um, and our ability to, you know, build these these kinds of new tools and capabilities um, for observing. 
Okay, so when you when you say it's a matter of the new technology developing, is that mostly getting the probes up into space? Like the lift is difficult, or do we need to develop better lenses, better algorithms, better hardware? Well, we're going to do all, we do that anyway in the Everything. tech sector. Everything. It's always got to go faster, see more, right. work, you know, the, the last longer, all, you know, on you the blockchain. we're on. always accelerating the technological capabilities. Um, so the, the, I think the, the, the real, the real question is how do we ensure that this kind of technology is financed, whether it's through private investment or through government investment or university investment. Every time we learn how to do something better or we fail, that helps us understand how to do it the next time. It's always gonna be an iterative cycle. If we think about a, you know, the personal computer, it's like, you know, we started with a certain amount of capability and we, you know, reinvented it the next year and we reinvented it the next year. So we're going to see that same kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, investment that it gets reinvested and reinvested and gets better and better each time we do it. Well, it, it seems to me that the, uh, the private investment angle, everybody's asking the question, what's in it for me? Um, and just the kind of the vague notion that, well, you might get hit by an asteroid, but it's not terribly likely. Um, how, how do you answer that question of what's in it for them? And is there, I, I mean, I would love to go on a spaceship up there and actually fly near an asteroid and help steer it out into outer space. That, that seems like fun, but it's uh, actually doing something like that is going to require like 27 years of my time and... Uh, uh, 150 billion dollars or something like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, how, how do you how do you talk to a billionaire about financing something like this? Well, there's a there's a few things in there. I I do want to say that um, the uh, the the Earth is largely unpopulated, largely covered by water. And so for your yeah. listeners, they should know that the chances of it hitting in your neck of the woods when they do hit is small. Um, so that's that's number one. Can we narrow um, down can we narrow down the zip code? <laughs> if we, we if aim we, them. if we knew where the asteroid was <laughs> and observed it and so that we could um uh, figure out its uh orbit and trajectory absolutely right down to the zip code with enough observations Four that's observations. what they tell me Four that's what they tell me no problem <laughs> um, as, far, as far as moving out into space and private industry investing in it, I mean, we've seen a lot of excitement about space resources. The resource that, you know, is going to be most valuable in the short term is, of course, going to be water. Um, so, you know, the, the glass of water on my desk here today was, you know, delivered by an asteroid um, as the Earth was formed. Um, and and so, you know, that is that is the most valuable resource in the short term that that these celestial bodies will um, provide. Um, mining is hard on Earth. It's going to be uh, equally as hard to do it in space. And so the idea that we would be mining and then bringing it back is definitely not on the 10 or 15 year time horizon from uh, our perspective. We'll have some great technology demonstrations. Everything that's happening on the moon um, in terms of you know resource utilization, understanding what the resources are, how might we be able to sample it? How can we understand what's there? Um, you know, these are all incremental steps for us to be able to figure out how we're going to do it on other bodies in the future. But asteroids are, you know, they're different than the moon. They don't have much gravity. Um, uh, and But there's many more of them, and they come closer, and we can get to them quicker than we can to get to the moon if we knew where they were. <laughs> Very good. So, so there could just be a big ROI on it. That's right. That's right. Um, and and so you know the the resource uh, part of this we love that story, and we always you know like to say you know you can't mine what you can't find, and the way that you find things, I mean the way that you understand what resources are out there is you build a map, and so it comes back to the need of having a map, and in this case it would be a dynamic four dimensional time being the fourth dimension of a map of the objects in our solar system. Um, and, you know, you just have to look back in history, like, you know, Lewis and Clark mapped the Western U.S. for us. They mapped 
the United States for us to understand where the resources were. What did we need to protect? What could we leverage? You know, that's going to be the same thing as we move out into space. It'll be different because um, it obviously will be in space. But but the first thing for 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 defense, um, for exploration, um, and for science is really to map things. And so that's why you know we keep saying. The base of this is that we need a map. And in order to have a map, we need to have data. And that, that reminds me of mapping the high frontier, the talk that uh, Dr. Liu gave for the Long Now Foundation. He said cartographical expeditions are driven primarily by fear, greed, and curiosity. And I think that corresponds well to the points you've made. I, I want to ask a related question, and that's about how to manage, may not be the right word, or change maybe public perceptions around this project. I have some follow-up questions as well, but but maybe just as a starter, are are you happy with the state of the public's perception of this problem? Do, do you think that they're appropriately invested in it? And if not, what are the kind of outreach efforts that you're engaging with to get people to realize that this is a problem, that it's solvable, that it's worth solving, and so on? So um, no, the public doesn't know enough, um, and that's why we that's why we you know created something called Asteroid Day. Um, which um, I co-founded along with uh, uh, one of our co-founders, Rusty Schweikart, Apollo 9, a young filmmaker by the name of Greg Richters, and Dr. Brian May, who's the lead guitarist from Queen. Yeah. So we created this day called Asteroid Day. We launched Asteroid Day by working in partnership with the Association of Space Explorers. That's a club of people who've been to space not space tourists, but have actually been to space and circumnavigated the globe multiple oh, times. Um, and so we co-wrote this declaration called the 100X Declaration, which is a call to action for humanity to accelerate the rate of asteroid discovery by 100X within a decade. So, you know, when we launched, we were finding about a thousand asteroids uh, uh, a year, new asteroids, near Earth asteroids, not the ones out in the main asteroid belt, the near Earth asteroids. Um, today, we're finding about three, so we have accelerated um, to some degree our rate. LSST is going to give us um, quite a quite a few more, um, but um, that call to action was sort of um, a threefold, right, which is that um, A, asteroids are interesting, B, they, you know, have resources that, you know, um, uh, could be of use to us um, as we move out into the solar system, and C, occasionally they hit our home planet. So we launched certainly with the defend the planet from asteroids message, but we also know that the public isn't always going to, uh, that, that message isn't going to, isn't going to resonate with the public, right? It's, it's sort of the sky is falling. And so that's why talking about the story of the science, of the discovery of the unknown, of, you know, going to new um, uh, bodies in our solar system, understanding the origins of life, which, you know, uh, many people believe will be, you know, in the kind of information that we got from the uh, Hayabusa 2 mission. There are now um, the samples from that um, mission from the Japanese Space Agency have now been shared with uh, research institutions around the world. We have another one um, uh, coming in August, uh, September of 2022 um, with OSIRIS-REx. Um, so we wanted with Asteroid Day for the world to really kind of love asteroids. Like, I mean, we wouldn't be here. We're mostly water. How did water get here? Well, asteroids brought it to us. Um, you know, what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, I mean, they had a bad day. Yeah. Um, uh, and 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 when we think about um, um, utilizing resources, it's like, you know, that's the promise of greed, as you know, as as, as Dr. Liu um, talks about in his presentations. Um so we have all three of those, and we felt like it was really important to educate the public about all three elements, the aspirational, the understanding, and the defense um, side of things. So while Asteroid Day has done really well, we're incredibly proud of Asteroid Day. You know, we modeled it after Earth Day. No one really owns Asteroid Day. I mean, we've got a, we've got a brand, we've got a website. But really, the heart and soul of Asteroid Day are these thousands and thousands of independently um, organized events that are done in countries all around the world in their language, with their experts, with their astronomy clubs. Um, so we feel like we've made good progress, but we want more people to understand the elements of, of, of what asteroids mean to us. We wouldn't be here without them. We might not be here if one of them comes. 
And we may be able to, you know, leverage them to, you know, go on another great um, age of, of discovery out into our solar system. So um, uh, education, we've made some progress, but we need to do a lot more. And so, you know, that's why we go out and talk to people um, on shows like yours to say that we think, you know, asteroids are exciting. We certainly don't want to go the way of the dinosaurs and, um, you know, learn more. And which, you know, of course, you can do at asteroidday.org and at b612foundation.org. Um, uh, and NASA's got great tools and the Planetary Society has got um, great tools um, to teach people about asteroids. It, it occurs to me that uh, the richest guy on the planet happens to be in the space business. And uh, it may take as little as two or three tweets from him to actually increase awareness of about a billion people on the planet would suddenly know what you're doing. Um, have Have you tried to connect with SpaceX? And uh, if if you can encourage a tweet um, around uh, <laughs> asteroids and learning about asteroids and our work, we would be incredibly grateful. Or if any of your listeners as well. Next time um, Musk comes on the podcast, we'll we'll alert him of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll yeah. have to do that. Yeah, uh, Musk or Bezos. These five things yeah. here. <laughs> That's right, Musk or Bezos. That's correct. You know, um, what was very exciting about the DART mission, the double asteroid redirect test mission, um, is that um, that was a SpaceX's first um, a deep space um, uh, mission. I didn't know that. Um, and so, you know, that that was an exciting um, thing for the organization. And and I, you know, I do know that um, Elon was excited that you know his organization was launching the first planetary defense mission where, you know, we're going to geoengineer our solar system. It's very exciting. So he probably knows about it peripherally. If you could just get him to actually tweet and stop manipulating the price of Dogecoin. <laughs> <laughs> or encourage all those investors with those coins to support us. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Some fraction of my crypto billions will, will go to. B612. We do take, we do take, we do take Bitcoin. <laughs> I feel like you have been answering this question for a while, but just in case, I kind of wanted to broaden it out a little bit and ask you about fostering longer term thinking in the public generally, but just people who like to think about things, I guess, specifically. And this is prompted somewhat by the association between your organization and the Long Now Foundation, which famously built the 10,000 year clock or is building the 10,000 year clock. I guess I'm, I'm not sure on the status of it in order just to give people a thing they could see that evokes in them the imagery of deep time frames. So obviously Asteroid Day is one part of that, obviously telling the story of, of the, the spirit of human adventure carrying us into the skies is another part of that. Do you have other efforts you're engaging in? Um, well, I mean, we have our two primary um, program activities uh, at, at B612, obviously, which is um, public education and, and building a, a map um, and whatever other tools we can to accelerate asteroid discovery. Um, you know, Long Now, um, of which I sit on the board of directors um, for as well, is dedicated to fostering long-term thinking and, and, and you know, Stuart, um, the, the, the founder, along with um, Xander Rose, who's the executive director, and many of the board members have always had this asteroid notion as like one of the just logical, like, like we know this happens and it can be, you know, a long-term thing that we should think about because we know it's gonna happen. It's, there's no question we're gonna get hit again. Um, uh, and you know, it could be tomorrow. And, and so it's, uh, it's, it's been, um, a very, um, nice sort of data point as long now likes to tell the story about investing in long-term thinking. I mean, one of the things that we don't have out in the world today is really, um, solid, well thought out curriculum about how do you think about things uh, in the long term? How do you think about being a good ancestor? How do you think about, building a, a, a community of practice um, that um, fosters this notion that we should be thinking in, you know, 100 year, 1000 year, 10,000 year timescales. That doesn't exist today. But it's a good example of where humanity is capable of making progress. We are learning as we're going along. And there's a really nice community of people um, around the Long Now um, Foundation and uh, who, you know, are trying to figure out how do we make and help and participate with humanity's ability to think more long-term 
not with a 10 year forecast, but think long term. I mean, and you know, you look you look to the to the scale of evolution. Um, you look to the scale of you know biology of of you know of of civilization. These are all great lessons for us to kind of um, begin to get humanity thinking about um, things from a uh, a longer term perspective, in a time where our, our attention is you know. Um, uh, short circuited with the uh, uh, at least in the in the Western world, uh, you know, in the social media realm of what happened in the last three minutes. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're just a couple weeks away from Christmas, and we see all the Christmas lights up all over the place, and and whenever the Fourth of July ro- rolls around, we see fireworks going off everywhere. How do you celebrate Asteroid Day? <laughs> <laughs> is there a mascot okay, well i'll tell you how we celebrate that so 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 you know there's all these events that happen all around the world and any day could be asteroid day but a lot of them happen around june 30th um, which happens to be the the anniversary of an asteroid that blew up in tanguska in 1908 and wiped out an 800 square mile area um uh uh with by an asteroid that's um about was about 45 meters um so you know, we do a global broadcast. We bring all these experts and astronauts to a tiny country called Luxembourg. Um, and, and, and then we have a party and we have an asteroid day cake. Oh, okay. I love it. <laughs> we celebrate with a cake. Okay. <laughs> and each year it's been getting better and better. So that's how we celebrate with a cake. So and, the cake and, getting bigger? Bigger cake? Is that it? Yeah, you know, different <laughs> styles of the cake over the last couple of years. And then the independently organized events around the world have been, you know, sort of taking our cake ideas and 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 transfer, transforming them into their local communities and their, their celebrations. So we celebrate with cake. Yeah, it occurs to me that you need need a, um, to kind of crystallize this idea of how to celebrate Asteroid Day. This um, kind of the events leading up to it and have a have a hard firm date when it's going to happen and then you definitely need the hallmark cards you need the cards that you can send out to all your family and friends you should have asteroid cupcakes that you like throw at people throw at each other yeah water balloons or something oh that's good well i I, I love the idea i i think that will be a great sort of moment in 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 humanity's understanding of asteroids if there if hallmark (laughs) actually does a happy asteroid day uh set of cards i'm looking forward to the hallmark asteroid day cards Yeah. I'm going to propose those cards, in fact. <laughs> yeah, I think we should have an asteroid channel on television, shouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the least we could do. Yeah. We do run um, something called Asteroid Day TV and that we run off of the asteroidday.org website for the entire month of June, um, where we've aggregated content from people all around the world, most of it asteroid related. We've got some great fun cartoons, stuff from um, TED, um, content from um, TED.com. Uh, and you know music, and obviously some of the the videos that um, that we produce um, in Luxembourg. Um, so we have the beginning of it. We stream it over Twitch and over YouTube and off of our website. Um, and so yeah, I don't know if we'll be able to get a an audience for a 365 day a year Astro Day TV, but we've been trying to get 30 days of it. So what are some steps people can take to try to further? these goals? Um, Well, go out and talk to your friends, learn something about asteroids. Um, As I said, you know, we've got materials about the work that we're doing here at B612, B612 foundation.org. Asteroid Day has got a lot of fantastic content that we've developed over, you know, the last six years. We've got a whole learn series. If you just type in learn on Asteroid Day, um, there are, you know, content, um, uh, you know, little syllabuses for with videos and exercises and and that kind of thing. And then the, the, the really the fun part um, uh, are these independently organized events. And so we have a Asteroid Day event coordinator toolkit and that you can download and, you know, ho- host your own kind of event. Um, and we've had, you know, just crazy, wonderful events over the years. And um, some of my favorite ones, you know, aside from the, you know, the real deep science and technology ones and, you know, the astronomy clubs going out and bringing out their telescopes and, looking out um, into our solar system and for asteroids. Um, but there have been some fun ones, um, you know, pizza, a pizza 
place that has a pub associated with it. Um, a few years ago, um, the owner had a 300 pound meteorite. He put it in his wow. pizza oven for five days and then he made um, beer the <laughs> old way by putting a stone in with the hops and he released Asteroid Day Ale on Asteroid Day. Wow. And so, you know, he used that as an opportunity wow. to um, educate his community about asteroids um, as well as drink some beer. Um, to me, I thought that was, you know, a really fun one. Um, we've had uh, there and these there these um, ideas are up on a, on the Asteroid Day website. Um, pub crawls with asteroid quizzes. Um, so you know, going from pub to pub um, with your you know quizzes on asteroids and people um, teaching each other about um, various um, aspects of of asteroids. Um, and and you know we had a wonderful event um, in Tanzania that that is the home to the sixth largest uh, meteorite in the world and they had three days of celebration around their meteorite where they brought their community together they played football the kind of football the rest of the world plays not the U.S. market <laughs> and where they played football and they did art classes of you know making asteroids and different kinds of um, uh, geometry and physics kinds of uh, activities so you know asteroids can be fun we want asteroids to be fun um, they're interesting on every level it's a great asteroids are just a great way to to enter into um, the story of you know how we came to be and so the public can get involved by learning something and having fun or learning learning a lot more um, uh, more deeply uh, about the subject of asteroids. Well, I love those ideas. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Uh, only that, you know, I hope that everybody um, has an opportunity to look to the sky. We've got a great um, comet, um, the comet's slightly different than an asteroid. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a snowball, um, so that's why we have a trail. There's a great asteroid that's um, visible right now, Comet Leonard. Um, but any day, any night, look to the sky. I mean, all of the shooting stars that you see in the sky those are asteroids. Those are those are small asteroids, meteoroids hitting our, our our atmosphere, and what you see twinkling across the sky is an asteroid. And so, you know, enjoy the beauty of them, um, enjoy the discovery of them, and join us for Asteroid Day. Well, Danica Rumi, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, that that was great. Thanks, Danica. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.